I think we're at the point in this symposium where we're starting to develop some productive conflict and discussion, which I think was exactly the intention of the symposium. This next panel is composed of a kind of wide variety of people with very different points of view. So this is the, this is I guess in a sense where the rubber hits the road because they're all architects. They're all architects or architectural scholars. So the discussion is gonna turn back towards one with a more architectural focus, hope of hopefully synthesizing, rejecting, conflicting ideas about what we've heard over the last few days, but also uh, adding even more to the table. As I mentioned uh, yesterday and the day before, this isn't a symposium where we're trying to get any definitive answers. In fact, we're just looking for not the bonfire to warm ourselves around, but embers to take with us and perhaps nurture, nourish in different disciplines in different ways. So with that in mind, uh, Michael Speaks has generously agreed to moderate this panel, um, which I thank him immensely for. Uh, Michael Speaks is the Dean of the School of Architecture at the Syracuse University. Previously, he was Dean of the College of Design at the University of Kentucky from 2008 till 2013. He has also taught in the graphic design department at the Yale School of Art and in the architecture programs at Harvard University, Columbia University, the University of Michigan, UCLA, the Art Center College of Design, the Berlaga Institute, and the TU Delft in the Netherlands. He was founding editor of the cultural journal Polygraph, former editor at NA New York, and former contributing editor to Architectural Record. Michael Speaks is what one might call a canary and has been so for decades within architecture, always seeming to catch whiffs of what was coming well before the sense of change wafted over his peers. He was instrumental in the introduction of Dutch architecture into the American scene in the 1990s, for which we forgive him, <laughs> and was equal present, equally present about the end of the critical or the beginning of the post-critical well before anyone else, even today, got the message. In 2014, he was again in canary mode, among the first to organize an architectural symposium specifically dedicated to object-oriented ontology at Syracuse entitled Speculations on the Real, Graham Harmon, and the Triple O Challenge to Contemporary Architecture. Several speakers in this auditorium were at that fantastic event, witnessing, in particular, that that kind and well-dressed canary, in fact, actually has pointy teeth. Uh, as he launched a fierce Miyasuian attack on the gentle, kind, charismatic, intelligent, friend and friendly, but unsuspecting participants. With this history of foresight and commitment to intellectual and intelligent discourse, pointed or not, Michael Speaks is particularly well suited to moderate the panel, the aesthetics of the progressive architecture and the state of the contemporary, which is specifically designed to have a kind of generic inclusiveness to it, to allow as many reactions as possible to hit the table. Please welcome me, welcome Michael Speets back to the Yale School of Architecture. Okay. Do I do it from here? Uh, yeah. Both. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. It's terrific to be here. Actually, the last time I was here, uh, no, I won't say the last time I was here. Uh, uh, it is interesting to note that the very first uh, installment of an exhibition I did many, many, many years ago in 1999 uh, to Mark's chagrin, uh, Big Soft Orange, uh, happened at the, it, this was the inaugural uh, year of, uh, of, of Bob Stern's uh, sort of tenure here. So, um, so Mark is probably very pleased there's no longer uh, any Dutch architecture I'm going to present today and maybe other things. Um, I'm, I, what I want to try to do is maybe respond uh, in a very oblique way to some comments that were made earlier, uh, and then maybe more directly. But also, um, I noticed on the, um, uh, on the conference proceedings that uh, unlike other moderators, I was expected to lead people in something without having something already presented to them. So there's really nothing to respond to. So I'll just... The rest of, well, I wasn't here for the rest of the conference, so that's, a, that's, a, that, that's perhaps a, a problem. Uh, in any case, I'm, what I am going to do is uh, um, 
make just a few quick comments and then I'll introduce the, uh, the speakers or the, the respondents to the, to the thing that, which has not been presented. Um, uh, but first, I would say it, it, this is a remarkable conference. It's an incredibly eclectic group of people that you all have brought together here to talk about aesthetics. I enjoyed enormously the presentations this morning, and they confirm my rightness about things I'm going to say later on, so that's the reason I enjoyed them so much. Um, uh, but I also enjoyed them apart from that. Um, I also uh, got to meet very briefly one of my heroes last night, uh, Jacques Rancière. Now, it was a fantastic conversation that Mark... Uh, uh, scripted and, and, and participated in last night. Um, the only thing I wonder, uh, particularly uh, given some of the presentations this morning, is that the critique of expertise and the critique of the canon and the critique of philosophy and the critique of all things enlightenment has not only led to liberation and terrific things, it has led to the truthy, Trumpy world that we now live in, which is which is dangerous, uh, obviously, for, for, for many, many reasons. And so, and so, the, so, the, so the ignorant and, uh, pr uh, and, and acknowledged ignorant critique of philosophy wholesale, I think, uh, is an ignorant because, it is, uh, because if you understand the critique that speculative realism in general, but Triple O in particular, is making, it is making a critique of philosophy itself. It is trying to put philosophy in a different place than it was before. And of course, if you admit to ignorance about that, you cannot then critique it because you have no idea what you're critiquing. So let's just start with that. I'm going to read something very short, not because I, I need guidance, but because I write so beautifully that I, 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 can't, I can't imagine that you would not want to hear these first two paragraphs. When Mark asked me to do this, I thought, what am I going to say? And I realized this morning I had written two paragraphs of an essay and I couldn't figure out what it was going to go for. But I think it's now perfect for this and I'm going to share this with you. But, but I think it's absolutely right and everything that I heard this morning confirms the rightness of what I'm about to read. <laughs> no comments yet, Mark. Hang on. So, so today, and, and I'm also shocked that no one has mentioned Patrick Schumacher yet. Uh, but I will now. Okay, Graham did. Okay. Today, no single ideology, style, or approach, no poetic ism of the new defines or dominates contemporary architecture. Only Patrick Schumacher, principal at Zaha Hadid Architects and proponent of parametricism, has even made the effort. Schumacher may, in fact, be the very last of the architecture vanguard to voice and answer the call for the new. And that is because in architecture, as in almost all of contemporary life, the call for the new has been superseded by the revelation of a reality more complex, more weird, more indeterminate, and thus more open to the future than any delivery on the promise of the new could ever have been. From speculative realism, the celebrated movement in contemporary philosophy whose adherents confront us with the strange reality of hyper objects like global warming, so massively distributed in space and time that they outstrip the capacity of the human mind to comprehend, to the fashion industry's haute couture embrace of vetements, the outrageously ordinary and obscenely expensive real clothes, restitched DHL t shirts, and Walmart inspired sweatpants, designed by Demna Gusvalia, head of the anonymous fashion collective of the same name, and recently appointed artistic director of the renowned Parisian house, Balenciaga, and almost in every cultural way stop in between, including, and especially what we heard this morning, the real has reasserted itself over the enlightenment and has reasserted itself over the true, in that sense. Um, so I would say today, uh, we have no single, I, we have only one ideology of the new in architecture that, is, that remains, and that is Patrick's. And as misguided and as bizarre as it is, it's not even true anymore. It is simply itself one among many competing ideologies of the real. So why is it that we should study philosophy? Because philosophy is one of the very important registers of contemporary discourse and thought that is asking us to return to the real, 
So is it happening in fashion. So is it happening in architecture. So is it happening in many, 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 many discourses. And so, so I would say, um, on the contrary, philosophy uh, is, shouldn't be a leader. It is, also, it is simply one among many uh, uh, assertions against an Enlightenment, Kantian, post-Kantian worldview and an assertion for a turn, not a return, for a turn to the real. Um, I would say, uh, you know, the, the, the Goldsmiths UCL conference in 2007, which many people have probably already talked about, featured uh, uh, Quentin Mayasu and Graham Harmon. Um, speculative realism was launched and then very quickly probably died as a thing, but uh, it launched a lot of very exciting thinking into the world. What it did for, why is it important in architecture? Because architecture from the 1960s through the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s and still in many places was dominated by the linguistic turn. By the turn that Charles Jenks and Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown and many people including Peter Eisen and many people who've been through and lectured in this building, they created a paradigm through which one could only view architecture as images and as representations. Architecture was inaccessible as the real. It displaced phenomenology, which should have been displaced, but instead of replacing phenomenology in a naive realism, it simply gave us another filter through which to look at architecture, to see, to view, to experience architecture. And what's important today about speculative realism and about Triple O and about the work of Maya Su, um, is that they are asking us to or they are, they are they are asking us to follow a parallel track? They're not asking us. We are following a parallel track in many other disciplines and discourses to the one that they are pursuing, uh, which is to return to a belief in the access of the real. That's I think that's I think that's that's why. So that that's why we need to look at philosophy. So the very things that Jonathan criticized philosophy for having no access to or in fact enabled precisely by and are parallel to the very critique that speculative realism is making of Enlightenment philosophy itself, I would say. Someone could clap for that if they wanted to. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, okay, just, just a, so, so how did this happen? In architecture we have you know, the emergence of, of this linguistic model in the 70s and 80s, we have uh, deconstruction as a philosophical kind of overlay in architecture. Then we have Gilles Deleuze and the work that many people in this room had some interest in. Uh, and with the leverage of Francis Bacon, let us see uh, into another slightly post-linguistic view of the real, but it, did, it, but it only cracked the door. We didn't get fully, fully, fully into that. Um, one of the things that I, and this is maybe what, what Mark was talking about earlier, I, I've been disappointed that in architecture we have not taken up the speculative. We have taken up the realism bit, but we have not taken up the speculative so much. Um, it hasn't been developed. The, the real that might be accessed from speculative thought, I think, has not really emerged. But the real, the return to the real, or the interest in the real, has certainly been dominant in the last three or four years in architecture. Rem Kohlhaus's 2014 Venice Biennale is called Fundamentals. Who would ever have imagined that Rem Kohlhaus, of all people, would be interested in returning to the essence, the truth, the fundamentals of architecture? That's an interest in the real. The Chicago Biennale from 2015 was a turn to develop a platform not to feature star architects, maybe not even to fe feature architects at all, but to feature practices. The assertion is that practice is, in a sense, the new real. 2016 selection of Aravena, first as a Prisker Prize winner, also confirms this, as does his 2016 Venice Biennale entitled Reporting from the, from the front. Reporting what? Reporting the reality of the world that has not been acknowledged by the Venice Biennale to this date, and reporting on that, yeah? So, so, so we have seen this return, I think, to the real uh, in, in many, many disciplines, in architecture included. Um, uh, we see in our, and we will see on this panel, and I think later on today, one of the more concentrated, of, uh, let's say, focus areas of this return 
has been through triple O. Um, and it has, it has been, the, this discussion has been engaged by Mark Gage, Verticolaton, Michael Young, by a number of people. Um, last night, Dean Burke at dinner, uh, before uh, welcoming uh, everybody, making comments, uh, uh, we were hearing a lot of hubbub outside on the smoking part of the apartment. Uh, they were all Cyark people. She said, we've heard, uh, I can't, I don't want to hear anything more about Cyark. A lot, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of Cyark interest, uh, let's say, in Triple O. And Graham Harmon has, is, is there right now. I want to ask her not about that later on. Um, uh, why is that? Why is that? Because Triple O is interested in, among other things, as you've heard already, the weird reality of objects. Of, of, of a real access to objects that withdraw and that, that appear, that, that, that pull away. That's not an interest in the new. That's an assertion or a reassertion of a world of the upside down, maybe, uh, of a world uh, that, we, that, that was there, that was perhaps there all along, but we couldn't see it because we were looking through linguistic glasses and we were looking through Kantian and post-Kantian glasses. So I would say today what we, what we have and what we see in the world is really the end of the Enlightenment, the end of uh, any kind of call for the new, and the struggle among many, 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 many reassertions and assertions of the real. And that is really the, that's the ground, that is the plane on which I think all of the discussion and debate has, is occurring today. I think, that would, I think it would be on that ground that one could make a critique of, of triple O, of speculative realism, of many, many, many other things. But you cannot make the critique of philosophy wholesale unless you understand what philosophy it's critiquing. And it is critiquing itself. And I think that's a really exciting thing that's happening right now. Um, in fact, weirdly, uh, one of the things uh, actually, at the very, at the, um, at the beginning of the session where we were serving, where, where you were serving those French drinks that have a number in front of them, and I had a number of them, so I don't remember the number now. Uh, but uh, as those were being served, I, uh, w w I got to meet uh, Jacques Rancière, and Peggy Diemer was chatting with him. And Peggy said, Peggy was asking about Louis Althusser and, and about what the, what the break was like with Louis Althusser um, over many things, but over, particularly over, his, uh, over the 68 response to the students. I was trained as a commie. I was a student of Frederick Jameson's. I, I, I was an Althusserian at one time and loved all that stuff and was obsessed with it and, and read, read Reading Capital over and over and over and over. Uh, and, and I too, uh, uh, not to parallel uh, Rancière's break with Althusser, but of course we all broke with Althusser. But one wonders in the Trumpy truthy world that we live in now, how wise it is to completely give up on a distinction between science an ideology, yeah? What I think we need is a new kind of science. We need a new kind of, a, a new reconfiguration, a rethinking of what that might do, how, how that kind of mode of thought might work. And I think one way for architecture to engage that could be to take up the speculative side of speculative realism. Um, but, uh, but today, we're probably not gonna talk about that. So, uh, what we will talk about, or what they will talk about, because I now have done my bit. Um, I have two questions. Two questions, big questions, which I'm sure they won't be able to answer, but I'm going to ask them anyway. Um, how today, in architecture, in art, in philosophy, in whatever, in activism, how do we speculate? How do we think about what's possible without turning, with, let's say, while considering, but without turning our back or turning towards, again, the universal truths of enlightenment modernism? How do we think, how do we speculate without returning to the nostalgia of the new, the nostalgia of utopianism. I know some of you probably love utopianism. I will argue with you about that if you would like. Um, how do we also navigate the turn towards the real without wallowing in the naive realism, the naive uh, assertions of authenticity, and without the ambition to really access the real real, which is impossible. Yeah. How do we do that? How, is that? how are those two things possible? Those are big questions for architecture, for the conference, for art, for everybody. Um, we have maybe more specific questions I will, I will pose to the 
to the panelists, uh, but before we do so, I'll have to introduce them. Although uh, Mark asked me not to read from the prepared biographies that he gave us, so I just rewrote those on my own paper. So I'm not reading from the ones that he wrote, I'm reading from the ones that I rewrote, which are actually better anyway. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce first uh, the first speaker whom I know very well, uh, I love this guy, uh, Hernan Diaz Alonso, he's a director of SciArc as of uh, 2015, he's a practice called Spirotark, uh, 2005 winner of the, uh, the PS1 uh, competition in New York, uh, the MoMA PS1, 2012 Educator of the Year, and a guy super, super smart, but always tries not to reveal it. Yeah, that's my, so this is, I have a little personal tag with all of them. Uh, Lydia Kalepolidi, uh, 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 trained as an engineer, PhD from Princeton, uh, assistant professor now at, uh, at RPI. She was previously at Cooper Union, and in her biography, I note that she does not mention that she was at, so at Syracuse before. I, mean, I, I would think that was a kind of a Princeton thing, because I really don't like Princeton or Princeton people, period. Except, except Jonathan put it on his bio, so it's not a Princeton thing. It's just Lydia didn't put it on her bio. Lydia was at Syracuse for a while. Let's just say that's my personal tag on Lydia. Yeah? She also was engaged in the Eco Redux project, which is an amazing project. I saw her work, uh, I didn't tell her this, last summer at the... Um, Shenzhen Biennale, which was really incredible, and uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Um, Jason Payne, whom I really like uh, because last night he looked at me and said, I love that jacket, but he also said, that's because I have one just like it. That's Jason Payne. It... <laughs> He's an associate professor at UCLA. He's a principal of Hirsuta. Uh, 2006 MoMA PS1 finalist, he has incredible taste. Uh, you would have to love him only for the title of his last couple of projects, uh, Raspberry Fields and Rawhide. I, I can't say any more than that. Uh, Rhett Russo, who was, uh, was at our conference that, that Mark uh, alluded to earlier that we did maybe two years ago. Um, uh, he is the undergraduate chair at RPI. Uh, he, his office title is Specific Objects, so he is really going to have to do a lot of work on this panel. He's exhibited work at many places, including other objects in Rotterdam, and for that he's going to really also have to do some explaining to Mark and to me, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, and Albina uh, uh, Yaneva, whom I, who's the only uh, participant I have not met, but we met last night, and I'm very thrilled to... Uh, to know her and to know her work. I knew her work, but I didn't know her. She's visiting professor, I believe, at Princeton this semester. She's director of the Manchester uh, Research Center. Uh, she has done two books that run, that kind of stretch the range of this conference, Politics of Design Practice, which I think is super, super important and one of the really defining features of some of the territory today where the real is being claimed and reclaimed. Practice is more important than architects. Um, and the making of a building. Uh, I should say, Politics of Design Practice is 2017. Is it out yet? It's, well, I, this is only 2016, I guess. It's not out yet. It will be out next year. Uh, and the making of a building 2007, which is fantastic. And she, uh, she did an incredible book also in OMA, which I have read. Um, so those are the panelists. I will ask them to come to the front now. And they can start by saying anything they want, but I would love to hear them answer some of my questions. Please come up. Does this work? <laughs> you guys have a technology problem here. Is this working? OK. OK, so maybe we'll start. Uh, uh, Mark, how long do we have? 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Um, th this is a, a voluble, uh, non-shy uh, group. I probably <laughs> don't have to say anything more, but I will, actually. Uh, uh, and maybe I'll just start and, and ask, because actually some of these, some of these uh, participants were at a conference we had this last year at Syracuse. I'm just getting it in, Syracuse, um, uh, last year. And we actually had a discussion about some of these, uh, uh, some of these ideas vis-a-vis -vis the Chicago Biennale from, uh, that had just opened. And p many people, including Patrick Schumacher, were criticizing many things about it. But 
Um, I wonder if you all agree with anything I've said, and if you don't, if you don't really care what I said, that's fine, but maybe you would have something to say about where do you see, where are we right now? Because the subtitle of this is contemporary, uh, or it speculates about where we are in contemporary architecture practice. In a way, we are in architecture, I think, in as disparate a place as, the, as this conference, because there are big, anchors in the conference, there's this, there's that, there's that, but there is no clear sense of what this conference is, has been, maybe after the fact, it, what it will be about, but where do you see us right now, and do you agree with anything I say? And the more you agree with what I say, the, the happier as a moderator I will be. Red. Yes. <laughs> anything. Uh, how do we speculate without the enlightenment? or sort of relying on enlightenment uh, sort of philosophy. Um, can you hear, can you hear Red? Because I can't. My microphone, okay. Can you guys hear me in the back? You guys would not work very well as spies. Can you guys come get some? Bad <laughs> time. <laughs> You're right. Sorry, Red. I mean, I think that's a, a maybe, is this better? Yeah. This feels so uncomfortable, but okay. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, I actually don't think we're uh, really able to speculate at all without uh, acknowledging that we're in a kind of enlightened territory to begin with. I mean, the, the work in the last uh, panel session that uh, was uh, identifying the sort of the GPS environment that we exist in as a kind of state uh, of all, all presence all the time, I think is a really interesting one. And uh, for me, as a, it's lately, and it's certainly in respect to this conference, one of the things that's been on my mind is how do we begin to uh, shift a kind of educational paradigm where uh, the real becomes actively participant, both in this kind of big GPS network live state as a material condition, but also as something where uh, things like history and things like uh, uh, design are actively coming at us as data and as kind of fields of information that we see <coughs> through, not as a kind of uh, neutral repository, but the space of actually working. So, uh, and, and one analogy I'll give to this and sort of why it's been on my mind has been uh, my kids' involvement in Pokemon Go. And uh, the sort of really weird, uh, strange things that uh, being within that connected network and being within a kind of world of information uh, has given certain people a kind of empowerment to go out and actually discover architecture and see the city in ways, actually understand the city through AR equally uh, at the time they're not able to understand it through a map. And I find that incredibly fascinating, incredibly an interesting place to start to think about speculation. Um, but I also found in the last panel too, incredibly interesting to think that something like a Hawaiian punch bottle could be something to change or, you know, when you're talking about the, the punch bottle becoming the gas mask, uh, the kind of weird uh, possibility that philosophy, uh, in particular, the kind of object-oriented approach is something that allows us to begin to understand that those objects exceed our expectations, they're full of chances, and that education should really be a way of investigating that kind of space, whether it's in the context of technology, maybe a kind of high art or high enlightened position, or the, the position of the Hawaiian punch bottle. I think that dichotomy as a form of speculation where it's a kind of equally flat ontology is a beautiful one, and a one where that's the kind of real space that we're, we're in at the moment. Anybody want to pick up on that? Well, I would just make, this is more of an observation than any kind of grand answer to any of your questions, but, uh, but mentioning the, the, the um, Hawaiian punch bottle, it's occurred to me recently, and it's, and it's especially poignant in this place with this, uh, with, with this conference, that the, that, that those of us, wherever we are on the kind of um, uh, spectrum of practice, um, those of us who 
wound up, for whatever reasons even, committing ourselves to the design of objects. So specific objects is the most uh, kind of perfect named example. But um, those practices that have been doing that for some time um, uh, seem to, uh, but, but were relegated to a kind of an underground. At least I kind of felt that way. Um, it, this seems to not be persisting that, that relegation. And there's a certain, I wouldn't call it a celebration, but an interest in, a renewed interest in those that develop objects. So that's a, that's a very specific kind of um, observation I've had over the last couple of days that's new to me. It's, un, it, you know, it hasn't been the case for um, really as long as, long as I've been practicing that there would be um, uh, some sort of uh, uh, this kind of focus on those kinds of practices. Again, you know, however far apart the practices may be. You're, 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 you're an ethnologist of practice, maybe. Yeah, well, uh, I agree with you. Uh, practice is the new Can real. And this is not enough. No. This is not enough. No? No. OK. All right. Yeah. So I agree with you, practice is the new real. And uh, there were a number of philosophical frameworks, not just all, all, which have invited us to look at the real. And this has started long time ago, I would say. Uh, and I, would not, I, would, I don't want to advocate any of those particular philosophical frameworks um, as being more suitable or less suitable for explaining architectural practice or any architectural work. Uh, indeed, uh, it's the interest in the real that matters, as opposed to critical interpretations, uh, the back to the kind of sublime and hidden rationale behind the design creation and all this kind of discourse that we had. Uh, so practice is important, but practice, I agree with you, that's the other thing I agree, but the rest I don't dis uh, I disagree, that there is a danger indeed to fall into a kind of naive interpretation of reality. But there is equally a danger or a naive kind of empiricism if we study architectural objects or architectural practices, but there is also the danger to kind of very uh, easily take concepts from here and there because mm. they're fancy, because they're trendy, mm. and to take them into the field of architecture, claiming that we explain something with those concepts, whether it's uh, spe speculative realism or, or networks or, or, I don't know, black boxes or, or quasi-objects or whatever is uh, on the table or whatever is trendy. We cannot take those conceptual frameworks and concepts or, or um, notions in the field of architecture and architectural practices without thinking what is it that we take what is the nature of the transportable and whether those concepts and frameworks ha are able to explain anything in architectural practice and can help us to grasp this reality and richness of the architectural processes in a better way. So we have to be very careful what we transport, how we transport it, and to be also very critical in terms of understanding the explanatory, uh, explanatory force of those concepts and uh, uh, um, and, uh, and theoretical frameworks. That's another danger, I would say. And this is, a more, it, this is, I would say, more dangerous than falling into the trap of naive realism or naive description of reality. Uh, and there was a lot of resistance, I would say, in architectural scholarship to go back to practices, uh, um, describing practices as naive, no one is interested in model making, or no one is interested in how architects draw, like, let's look at the big concepts of, of um, networks or folds, and let's try to conceptualize architectural practice. There was a lot of resistance, I would say, 10 years ago towards this shift to reality, towards the, uh, the shift to, uh, towards architectural practice. Uh, but I would like, uh, and, and the practitioners know this better than me, um, but I would like to go back to the, the theme of activism. Um, it's not working? It is. Now we have two. Uh, if, if you allow me to do so, because I think there's an interesting, an interesting concept here and many interesting ideas that have been discussed in the last two days uh, on uh, activism and 
Uh, and uh, um, I would like uh, to put this on the table that there is a different form of activism that emerges in architectural practices, very different from the kind of activism against politics with big P, the kind of organized activism, um, uh, which is pretty much related to this, uh, to the relationship to environment that architectural practice was facing in the last uh, few years, as David Rui, he's probably not here, in, He's here. Ah, yeah, all right, yeah. Uh, was very rightly saying a couple of years ago, architecture was com completely disinter uh, it was not interested in uh, uh, the issues of environment, you were saying, uh, in 2013. And uh, architects, with the issues of global warming and climate change, architects were forced to engage with the environment more and more. And if, even if we think about this problem of in, uh, environmental engagement, what we see in architectural practices, in particular in the last uh, a few years, uh, is a kind of activism from within uh, um, uh, architecture. Uh, a lot of, um, a lot of um, I would say, attempts to deal with questions of environment by transforming um, the environment, by transforming the ways of coexistence of uh, humans and natural entities or non-humans or whatever, uh, we call them, uh, because, des because designers, and we have, s we have seen this in many practices, for instance, the practice of um, uh, Philip Ram with the, the climatology interest, uh, uh, the practice of Davis, David Benjamin or um, Andres Hack, for instance, uh, from Columbia University, uh, the practice of Arian Harrison and Harrison Atelier. So we see a very interesting way of engaging with nature, nature not being a distant uh, object out there, passive, silent, nature that we only contemplate because it's beautiful. Uh, but it's an active engagement with nature that questions the composition of nature, the different ingredients, the different ways of, of, uh, of, um, um, of cohabitation. And architects actively propose in their practice new ways of arranging those compositions of humans and non-humans, new ways of rearranging the cosmos. Again, cosmos not as nature, as a passive a concept out there, silent and indifferent to our activities, but nature, but, but cosmos as the ordering of nature, as the active, aesthetically and morally pleasing ordering of things. And in that sense, designers and architects become more and more what I would call cosmopolitical designers. They engage into this kind of reordering of the relationships of humans and, and non-humans, and they offer new practical uh, compositions, new practical solutions of, of this the question of cohabitation, uh, instead of how, is, how does this relate to uh, cosmo, to activism, you You're would say? All oh, right, yeah. May, may I just, may I just <laughs> what we, what we ask in designers' practice? I want to just, uh, yeah. just clarify uh, or, or make yeah. a slightly more pointy. All of what you just said, all of those practices are in the most obvious way political and politically no, active. Wait, wait, let me finish. No, no, they're not. They're yes, they are, because they're, they are all practices that are engaged in, in activist <laughs> engagement with the world. No, the, 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 the question on the table, or at least, let's say, the question that is being asked is, or one of the questions that's being asked is, is it possible that there is an aesthetic activism. Is it yeah, possible? Well, yeah. So, that, you, is so those, that is not obviously addressed in the practices that you described. Yeah, well, let me just right. one, more, one hmm. line. That is activism, not with big A, because we don't have like an active opposition against, active action against a political statement or climate change. So architects do not act in a blatantly militant political way. Mm. They act from within mm. by offering those new arrangements, new, uh, new spaces of cohabitations of humans and, and, and uh, natural species and, and questioning pollution and challenging those issues of global warming. And in that sense, I think this is a form of aesthetic activism, activism ah, okay. From within, uh, uh, activism that emerges at the level of architectural practice. Lydia? Wow, uh, wow. Uh, <clears throat> I have to say that um, I don't think that activism is a straight line. And um, I, I believe in activism, but um, a more sly, underground, deviant type of 
authorship that might emerge um, if, uh, if you allow different forms of expression in the design. And um, I, I like all these practices, and I do believe that mobilizing our disciplinary tools towards causes is a worthy cause. Nevertheless, I think it's a, it's a much more complicated um, realism that, that, that we're discussing, and um, the type of activism that um, perhaps we were discussing over discussions in the last days um, is, is really tackling the complexity the, of, of the vast collection of images, forms, objects, ideas that we have, our availability with the internet, the fact that nothing is really new, the fact that manifesto is no longer a radical form of authorship uh, that can bring ideas to the forefront and challenge our kind of normative ways or, or perception because everything is out there in this growing, formless, yet not informed cloud of information, events, and so forth. And, and I do believe that when we witness that, and that might be dangerous or productive, it depends on how we see it, um, it really brings a humility to us uh, as authors uh, and questions what is the modality of authorship that we can engage as, as thinkers, uh, architects, and, and citizens, possibly? Um, and how can we possibly imagine, and this is already happening, and we have been in discussions with several of the people in the conference and others um, also, that authorship reemerges as a kind of reappropriation, rewriting, um, as, as a kind of transformation, inversion of value of facts, um, compiling together where the act of, of copying is no longer radical. If, if for Duncham uh, in the early 20th century it was radical to appropriate a urinal and re-put it in a different context, it is no longer radical for us today. We do that all the time. It is necessary. We are necessitated to do that. And, um, <clears throat> and that question, what is authorship? We deal with partial objects. We deal with, uh, with, with an idea of, of, of compiling, collecting, and transforming information to something that we will make that is no longer whole. And, um, and this is something that really questions um, what activism might be in this framework. A lot of practices, and it's not just us on the table or the people here, other people that are not in the conference um, have sometimes called this the post-digital era where everything is available. Um, I'd like to um, offer the, a term which comes from my own language, the death of parthenogenesis, um, which is a Greek word that means virgin birth. And um, it, um, it really is a, st it's a story about the birth of Athena from the head of Zeus um, and the idea that creation means the act of um, the bringing forth of ideas that, have, that are not ex uh, existing in the physical world and are completely new. This is, this is no longer what authorship is today. And that's possibly one realization that really might lead us to think of forms of activism that are, are more deviant, um, recursive, or sly, or thonic. Uh, the other realization, and um, this comes also from discussions that we've had between us, is that possibly um, the fact that, that complexity, the idea of, of the web, of the availability of everything simultaneously at the same time, the fact that the map of the internet that was published in 2005, the one with the neuron networks, I bet everybody knows this, is, 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 is possibly leading uh, practitioners, architects, thinkers to withdraw. Um, it leads to a type of closure or containment, a type um, that, as, as we discussed today, we need to focus on an exercise in a project that is fundamentally focused on a very, very specific abstract problem that is unrelated, not embedded to the physical world, so as to possibly generate something that can respond to the physical world. And, um, and this is something very important. Um, I, we, we talked about this with Rhett and Jason yesterday over coffee. And uh, maybe, maybe Tom Wisdom uh, was mentioning something similar in the discussion yesterday where he said, well, we focus on something very specific and abstract, and then we retrofit it for, for human use. Uh, maybe this task of closure, uh, containment, is absolutely necessary 
um, to be activist or to, to really generate any sort of, of, of creative engagement. And, and I do believe that the vastness of information, that the whole discourse of complexity that has eroded, um, and uh, what maybe Michael Speaks as refers to a kind of return or withdrawal from language um, is, is very important. And uh, it, it really is, is a kind of devolution that we necessarily have to engage with um, to, to move forward. May I ask a question? Um, yes, and one more thing. Relate, I, oh, oh. Yeah, I, actually, I knew I, that would prompt you. I never thought I would say that, yeah. but I kind of miss you now, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> uh, before you jump into, ah, my mic works. Uh, <laughs> the, the privilege to be beloved by Yale. Um, I, I'm going to do what most people do in this kind of thing, which is basically I'm going to say whatever I want to say without really caring that much if you have some relation with what you ask when other people are talking, because I think that's what we do in conferences. Um, <laughs> First thing, it's nice to see that the winter and the vegetation of Syracuse hasn't slowed you down and make you happier. Uh, that's always nice to see. Um, a couple of things of this. One, uh, I will say is, uh, I think your statements and your questions, uh, I think they're pretty much, I would agree with that. Uh, and I will not care, not because I don't care that you sense so one, because it's generally my overall attitude towards everything. I mean, I, I usually I don't care much what people have to say in these things. Uh, and the reason is, is this. Um, I have enormous faith in the power of the architecture discipline to keep doing what we always does, which is to misunderstand everything and move on into something else. <laughs> so I tend not to panic over any of these issues for the following reason. If, if we trace, and I think uh, Yale and Syracuse and Syac and Columbia, every school have these wonderful archives, you will find a conference like this every five years with everything is, we are in crisis, the, what architecture, we don't know what to do, what is the next thing? We come, we come with some conclusion, we all follow it, next three or four years we'll figure it out that was wrong, and we'll move into the next one. And it's always to the wonderful misconstruction, which is different than I think what Graham and Tim that what they, or with that very precise and solid and strange, and we always go and kind of, um, um, kind of not ruin, but we really misunderstand what they do and we transform into something else. So the first thing I will say is okay, it's gonna be fine. Um, we don't need to, well, okay, it's no problem. Uh, and second, in relation to this, um, I, I tend to be, I'm a man of simple taste in general, so I, I like to, uh, I, I like, I like to oversimplify <laughs> certain things. And I think part, part of it, what is interesting today, I think, uh, and, what Triple O and many other things bring to the table, I think is a possibility of the polemic to introduce new possibilities, how to see and discuss things. Uh, I think if we want to do tests of purities on those things and so on, I think we're on the wrong track, and I think it's a waste of time, and I don't think that's the right thing to do. I think it's the question is how do things unravel new possibilities to think about these notions. Um, I, I personally, I uh, think the idea of speculative realism to me, it was an interesting one, and probably it came from the misunderstanding of my own of that, of that term. And certainly it would be more interesting in the idea of speculation more than reality. I really think architecture does best when it stays out of reality, of any form and shape. I think uh, architecture is at best when it becomes fairly useless. I think it should come with a description of what great architecture is. And I know that many people will disagree on this, and I respect that, and I understand that. And I understand that demand that people have um, in relation to architecture to don't be that. But I really believe that every time the architecture tried to become active in terms beyond their own terms, um, I think we is when things go wrong. And, and more often than not, these mechanisms of optimism, um, from my opinion, which is you not know, the humble one, by now you understand that I'm a very arrogant guy, uh, which any ignorant guy is. Um, but I, I will say that this is a recipe for disaster because usually it becomes an excuse for the production of terrible architecture. And in that case, I will, be, I, will be, I will represent and I will try to argue for the defense of expertise. I still believe the value of expertise is not off the table and I think it will be a mistake for all of us to think that can be replaced. That doesn't mean that the idea of one interest in multidisciplinary and collaborative, I think that's terrific, but those words when there are multiple expertise coming in conflict. When you try to become a generalist yourself, or we, uh, to me that's, uh, is, again, is a recipe for disaster. And the last thing I will say is, it's fascinating how architecture, unlike any other creative discipline I can, I can think of, 
which is in many, many ways at the moral core, uh, a religious discipline, and is built on the fundament of timeless and duration, we are the kind of the most uh, irresponsible consumer of tendencies of any kind of influence that we have. Uh, and at the end of the day, we keep sort of doing more or less what we always do, but with a different kind of flavor. So to me, all these things are, uh, to say the least, uh, strange in the context of something that we're talking about, but not in any kind of sophisticated philosophical way, and just doing a straightforward strange in the way that my seven-year-old kid would say strange, not in the way of the sophisticated philosophical things that many other people are bringing to the table. So in any case, my, my whole point is um, I'm not really worried about any of these things. I, I understand that the level of uh, anger and my, my heart is full of love and generosity these days. <laughs> so I, I, think, I think we're going to be okay. Uh, I think we're going to be fine. Uh, and I'll see you in five years with, uh, <laughs> with, with another big symposium and conference or whatever will be uh, the theme du jour at that time. Yeah, I agree with you. With you and, uh, oh, that worries me. That's worrying me. <laughs> uh, that I will be, okay. okay can, can, can I try again? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, a couple of years ago, we invited uh, Isabel Stengers, the Belgian philosopher, Ooh, um, of, okay. um, the concept cosmopolitics, well, uh, uh, to Princeton at a conference around cosmopolitics. And she said, no, I don't want to talk to architects. And why, we said? She said, because architects eat a theory for breakfast, and I don't want my theory to be eaten by architects. Mm. And I agree with you that there are lots of, uh, lots of tendencies and trendy philosophical concepts out there. And this, this also worries me that, well, uh, the question for me is how inclusive we can be. How, how, uh, how inclusive in no, terms but of that's, the But that's the power of architecture. Yeah. It's weakness of insecurity as a discipline is what makes it powerful. But we also, are the most insecure yeah. discipline and we always look for validation with other disciplines. Yeah. And that's what makes architecture so powerful. And that's what it makes so many people who are not architects to be interested and engaged with us. But which also, doesn't happen the other way around. Which is a very right. interesting idea. I mean, yeah. we don't get invited to philosophy school to talk to philosophers, <laughs> or to art schools, or to science schools, or anything. Yeah. So we are a very generous and ignorant discipline, and we're interested and weak. No, ignorant is not the wrong word. We are weak. Uh, uh, in terms of our, what is make is what makes us the last and the ultimate humanist endeavor, and that's why I think architecture has that to contribute. And <coughs> to me, its weaknesses is its power, uh, and, yeah, I, and, but, I, and but, I think we should embrace that. Yeah, we, are, uh, we are, what worries me is that we are very inclusive and very receptive to all these new theories, as you say, or new trends, without having enough time to absorb them and to make something out of this that we can take back to architectural practice, to go but back no to one practice. Ever, no one ever does. Over <laughs> no, no, exactly. no one ever does. Yeah, but, yeah. No, 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 but yeah. at the same time. You know, you know what's interesting about what, or not, about what or not you just said about misunderstanding? I mean, I think he's absolutely right. Uh, if, you, if you look, for example, at the way that, that uh, uh, let's say, the work of Jacques Derrida was, uh, was consumed and regurgitated in architecture. The most interesting aspects of that were not uh, completed by architects who actually understood the work of Jacques Derrida. So, for, for example, Bernard Chumis' Parc de la Villette is the most perfect expression uh, of deconstruction in architecture. But it's actually boring and terrible. Um, uh, Eisenman's fundamental misunderstanding and misreading of it is infinitely, in my view, more interesting. Now, this is a this is a theory. This is a theory that Hernan is subscribing to. This is actually an old-fashioned literary theory uh, model developed by a very famous uh, teacher here, Harold Bloom. And so, and so, Cheers to that. yeah. Well, but the, I guess the point is, uh, you're not making a, a, a naive post or untheoretical argument to argue that it's uh, that it is. Um, more productive to misread theory and to reproduce it. In fact, that's no, no, one I'm of the most a fact. theoretical arguments. No, no, I'm yeah. just stating a fact. I, I'm not doing any speculation. I know, I know. No, no, I, I want to be about serious about this. It's, you're, but you're right I'm about it. I'm not doing a speculation. I'm just stating a fact. This is what we do. This is what the discipline does collectively and individually. It's what all disciplines do. Well, fair enough. Yeah. I mean, I'm just part of this one. So. May I ask a... May I ask a... <laughs> May, may I ask a, a, a kind of a general question? We'll start with Hernan, because, because I'm thinking back about Lydia's, uh, Lydia's uh, 
uh, assertion about new, subject, new subjectivities and, 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 well, not new subjectivities, but the way in which the subject has been reconstituted to think about activism in a different way. It's hard for me to think about activist practices without thinking about one of the words that got inserted into, and we, we talked about this last night, and we both agree that we disagree with this, um, uh, the, the word that got inserted into our title, which is progressive. Uh, now, now, what I'm curious about is, is it possible to have a, an, are, are, all, are activist politics automatically progressive? What is progressive now? And what is, I mean, SciArc has historically thought of itself from the moment it emerged as a vanguard school of architecture. Is it possible today to think of a vanguard school of architecture, a school of architecture that imagines itself not only on the cutting edge, but ahead of that, beyond, before it? Is it possible for a school to think of itself like that without thinking of itself as progressive? Uh... <clears throat> yes, I, I would say it's possible. Uh, let me put it this way. I think it's possible the ambition. I'm not so sure. I, I, I always think it's important don't confuse ambition with the results. I think as a school, you have to have, or at least, uh, at least our school, so I, you have to have that ambition to do that. Now, then I think things over time get more refined and more distilled. I would argue that the idea of avant-garde today is almost impossible because I don't think there are that many forces of resistance. So I think that needs to shape into something else, and that's why I think the word speculative or speculation has become so prominent. I will not argue that speculation replaced completely the avant-garde, but one could argue that it was a mutation or transformation notion of the avant-garde. Now, what the idea of pro being progressive and so on, again, I think ambition is one thing, results is another one. I personally think any institution of any field or any level should have, be, have to be based on the idea of progressiveness. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're always going to be ahead of the curve. I, I don't think that that can be controlled, and I think that relates a little bit what you uh, addressed when you were talking about, for example, if, if, uh, why the school does what it does, and I think, again, an institution like Sire, a school like Sire, um, like for example, I will not say that it's cool to subscribe to one form of progressiveness and so on, so if, if Tripolo, uh, an, an extraordinary philosopher like Graham, um, is interesting in joint SIARC, and we, of course we will have interest in Now, is that going to define every inch of the school? No, and it shouldn't. But any school that is interested in have uh, a sophisticated conversation has to be open to the polemic. I personally find polemic more interesting than progressive as a mechanism to operate. Now, the polemic I tend to be interested in, it has to deal with the progressive, it has very little to do with, conservative, con with the kind of a conservative approach. There is a kind of a, a conservative polemic too, which I find way less appealing, and I think it's kind of a antithetical with any sense of humanism. So I think, yes, it's possible. Uh, I don't know if it can be attained, but for sure the possibility to go for it, it has to be there, and you have to commit to it. Lydia, not, not so sure what do we do here. Lydia, progressive, we, we, we talked a little bit about that. It makes me what is, yeah. It makes you, I'm sorry, what did you it say? It makes me itch. Oh, okay. I don't know, maybe I'm misunderstanding it from the way that Mark um, uh, meant it when he changed the title. And maybe you can ask a question on that or, or say your thoughts on it. But um, I, I don't quite, it, it does, it is a term al allied with positivist thinking and a certain type of political ideology that does make me itch and is part of the Trumpy wor uh, world. Um, that you described as dangerous, rightfully so. Um, and I, I'm more interested in when, when you were trying to identify the features and the traits of the withdrawal from the linguistic turn, you did use at several occasions the word return. And this is something that, that we use, we use at, several, uh, at several occasions today, the return to the real. It's not, it's, it's the withdrawal from language is something that perhaps might necessitate, necessitate a kind of devolvement of sorts. Um, so I, I'm more interested in the regressive than the progressive, um, but the regressive not being a kind of return uh, historically to previous time periods, but another kind of model uh, to perhaps move or steer towards, towards the future. Um, and um, I'll, I'll speak more to that. Um, in a little bit, but I was interested, um, and this is kind of not entirely answering the question of the progressive, but it does 
Um, we did have a discussion on a dinner table two days ago um, about the idea of beauty that was suggested um, uh, uh, through Elaine Scarry's talk on, on Thursday. And uh, what, what, is, what are different perceptions of beauty? And if possibly we can identify ideas of aesthetics that are unrelated to health or unity, um, as was suggested two days ago. And uh, I believe it was Timothy Morton who came up with um, the term a halo of disgust, uh, which we all found really, really productive, uh, that something beautiful has always a margin, a fringe of disgust around it. Um, and uh, this is not, obviously, this is just a dinner table conversation. Um, but it does mean that anything that moves towards the future and necessitates this kind of regression is, is really uh, forcing us to retreat from one's expectations and to, um, to, to re really infuse um, digressive um, ideas in it. Regarding the aesthetics of the progressive, I, I, my immediate image in my mind, it makes me itch or, or a little weirded out too, the word progressive. Um, um, I have it's goosebumps. It's nothing to do with politics, by the way. It's actually probably to do with, with my sensibility toward, um, well, let me put it this way. When, when that word was inserted, and you mentioned it just now. I can't help but think of, the, of a graphic uh, um, image, the, the Hillary Clinton poster with the arrow that points in one direction, which is a, a quite, a, quite a nice poster. But it, uh, and politics aside, who cares uh, for now about that? It's, it's not about that. It's, rather, it's that arrow. The singular directionality of the mm. arrow really bothers me. And often when I, when I um, hear the term progressive being used in common practice or, or in more specific contexts such as this, um, I imagine that, that that straight singular arrow is attached to the word progressive and it really bothers yeah. me. I, I mean, I think in yeah. terms of, I think, more curly cues, multiple, <laughs> I mean, maybe it's just because really? I, I like, <laughs> like to draft, but I mean, I like, I like dash lines, I like dotted lines, I like recursive lines. Um, I like, I uh, love that stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so I wonder if, and, and you know, regarding, I want to try to link this up actually to something that, that Hernan was saying about the five year period of kind of anxiety crisis and everything. I actually don't, I usually agree with you, Hernan, but I, in this case, this feels like a very comfortable interlude to me. It doesn't feel like, so I'm sorry if I'm changing the subject. No. I'm progressive, but, um, and progressive practice. Um, but it feels like a very comfortable interlude uh, um, uh, and, and a productive one for its comfort. So I don't sense crisis. I sense a certain kind of, I wouldn't call it unanimity, but a certain kind of consensus that, um, and now I'll speak perhaps more specifically than some would like, but a kind of consensus that the digital project, or whatever you like to call it, is somehow, um, uh, it, it, it's time to move on and uh, do other things. This, this, period, this point passed several years ago, I think. But um, that we're in a kind of thinking period doesn't bother me at all. And you know, the way designers think is often in their studios, in their practices, you know, producing things. David Rue said something very interesting, and, and one of those questions that's gonna be bothering me for like more than a year, just last night or the night before, um, you said um, that Triple O will likely um, provoke multiple forms of making. I, I mean, that's a near quotation, I think. It's good enough. Um, what does that even mean if for the practitioner like inside the studio? That's I'm a very myopic kind of person often. And so I just think, you know, well, what does that even mean for inside my own studio? Anyway, I'm, I have no answers to that, but I would, I would reiterate that question as one that seems fundamental, not just to this panel, but actually to several of them. Um, 
and quite frankly, I don't know that any of us have answers to that. I have very personal answers that are going on in my studio right now, but it's not particularly relevant, I don't think, to the others. So I don't know how, to, how we even answer that question on a, on a larger level at this moment in time. We're passing it around now. Or Pass around. It's just like a bottle of beer. <laughs> Um, the, the progress question for me is also problematic, and I think primarily because um, I, I sort of have a, a, a similar sort of uh, reaction to the kind of materialist tendency to, to sort of um, be a kind of judgment of that certain things are progress and certain things aren't. Uh, and I think part of an aesthetic uh, life and an aesthetic practice for me has been always about finding those things that uh, actually may recede from progress in some way, hide or be cryptic or be invisible, and that there is some part of being aesthetically active which is about uncovering those things. And I think there are places, for me, where architecture becomes uh, the most uh, uh, cryptic and, and, and mysterious in the way that it does that are places where um, those kinds of inversions take place not only in terms of the way uh, the building is used or conceptualized, but the way it's built. Uh, and, and these things are in some way uh, antithetical to modernism, I think, uh, that, that, uh, that there's a kind of mystery in things or there's some, some deep sort of underneath submerged thing in, in objects. Uh, and for architects that, for me, that have been able to maintain uh, that kind of revolution in their work. And, and I always saw it as a kind of, uh, not a reactionary position, but a way of engaging a much broader set of realities. Uh, let's say that a builder could come into the middle of the process and change the building himself in some small way. Uh, that's an interesting possibility that architecture holds and, and would not fall within the realm of progress. Uh, it would form in the realm and in, in the kind of opportunity that architecture offers that I think Hernan uh, spoke about. I want to make one just uh, point of agreement, and then I know there. I see Peggy wants to ask a question, and we have we can maybe take uh, field a few questions. Okay, uh, but I just I just want to just make one observation and, and agree with Jason on this point about. Uh, the, uh, I want to agree with Jason's disagreement with Hernan. This means I'm not disagreeing with Hernan. I'm agreeing with Jason's disagreement with Hernan. Um, uh, uh, I think I think we're not. I think this is this. I'm going to agree with your sense that this is not a radical break. People are not wringing their hands and people aren't worried. Um, and it's precisely because. And this is why I brought up the question about progressive. Progressive means, or it's kind of an MSNBC way to nomenclature to describe all of the things that are good now that we don't know what we should be since we're no longer left or whatever that was. Yeah. Uh, so, so when that whole enlightenment worldview disappears, how then do you, what markers do we use to decide what we agree with and what we don't agree with? And the fact that what no one is interested in now is the next new thing means to me is a clear indicator that we are absolutely post enlightenment in that sense. And that's why words like progressive don't make sense to describe that reality anymore. So, and, and for me that's why this, why whatever competing view you may have, it is somehow post or anti enlightenment of some, in some kind of way. And it is also, so, it, it, it makes appeals to the real. And Lydia is quite right to say that I slipped and, and said, return to the real. I, I, I didn't really mean that. I, I meant a, a kind of an assertion of a real that maybe was there all along that we didn't see. Um, anyway, I'm just, I, I, I think we're not at a break moment, and I think that's because we're, we're at the end of the new, uh, which is an assertion of the new, maybe. Um, uh, and that, that, that prog and the progress and progressivism is part of that discussion. I want to go to Peggy because I know she. She had a, a question, or you, or did I, did I misinterpret? Oh, please. Yeah, I oh, just, I didn't see. I, I just uh, wanted to add that we also need yes. to integrate better this, the existing scholarship, past scholarship in architectural practice. For instance, if we, t if we think about the shift from architectural pro products 
towards processes and practices. This had happened in the, our discipline in the 80s with the work of Donald Chong and the work on reflective practice uh, with the, the careful uh, ethnographic description of architects at work of Dinah Cuff in the 80s again. So this uh, shift towards the objects, towards architectural practices and practices the new real has already happened in a way in our own discipline so we don't need OOO or OA or ANT to tell us how to look, well of course this provides a new and fresh look at architectural practices and architecture objects, but we have to take it by also considering the existing scholarship mm. and the existing interest in processes and practices. For That's sure you're arguing argue. for one version of the real uh, yeah, and, yeah. and triple O yeah. and adherence to that are arguing for another. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's just, uh, that's clear. The, for me, the real test case for you would be whether you can acknowledge someone like, uh, like a firm like you in studio as, mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a firm that's shifting the nature of practice because they've gone from a firm that's known primarily as producers of shape and form in a kind of a formal language to one that claims to be defined by the DNA of the knowledge that they produce inside the firm that leads or doesn't lead to, to, to to discrete to buildings or to other things. Peggy, do you need a microphone? It won't work, so you may as well just scream. Um, well, just to pick up on um, other ideas of the real, I, I, in particular when we talk about the return of the real, but, but I think the resonance that the real has for many of us is a Lacanian one. And the Lacanian one actually um, suggests that um, the real is what we are unable to um, organized in our linguistic um, framework and pops up despite our attempts to, in our, in our epistemological framework, to organize everything. And so examples of those things would be 9-11. Oops, popped up, wasn't in our framework, didn't work. Ferguson, oops, popped up, wasn't in our framework. Sandy, Katrina, popped up. Those are the real. And those are the, the, the reason the return of the real is associated with that is because it's all related to repression. All these things that we repress that don't fit tidily into our world come back up as the real. They're real. I think many of us think about the real in that way, and I know that that's probably not, but I think a lot of you are using the term with a cachet that comes from that Lacanian, Zizekian. Uh, May I disagree depth. violently? But, no, let me just speak, because yeah. I'm going to. Because you can't just speak. But I want to I wanna put this in relationship to the attack on poor Jonathan. On what? Um, oh, okay. Because, um, I'll, I'll, I'll disagree with that violently too, probably. Because I think in some way what he was suggesting is that if we don't actually acknowledge these suppressed things that we're not lettering into the canon and not letting into our institutions and not saying are part of the architectural discipline are going to come back and be the real. So why don't we actually talk about them now? I think it's pretty interesting. Okay. But, but one other thing is I actually do think that one of the things that make object oriented ontology appealing to all of you is because it stays within our comfort zone. It's like finally we can just think about the object because I've always just wanted to think about the object. So let me off the hook and let me think about the object. Okay, get it. I actually no, 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 think, I'm, I'm responding. No, no, I just want to say yeah. I, okay. I'm not no, interested no, no. whatsoever in triple O. No, okay. I want to be, okay. I, I want to be very there we clear. Go. My interest just, has to just do with to philosophy say, at large. It does seem to me that we want to think of philosophy and probably the return of the real in the Kenyan sense in a way that makes us uncomfortable with what our norm is as opposed We precisely to do not, I do not, and I don't speak for anybody else, but it is <coughs> precisely against the Lacanian church of the real. Remember, Jacques Lacan is the one who said, the unconscious is structured in the most radical way like a language. It is precisely post-Saucerian linguistics that this interest in the real is, is, is engaging. So no, we don't want to be reinterpreted in, into the Lacanian church of the real, the imaginary, and the symbolic. No, it is precisely not that. It is post, after, and go away with that. So, and, and in order to invoke that is to invoke a kind of, I'm sorry, in order to invoke that is to, is to, is to argue for a kind of language of repression that believes that you can access that and get to something really, really, really true, which just is not the case. Actually, think that there is something that we are not in control of that we actually do know exists and probably is a problem. We can say that we can't access it directly, and so like, let's just walk away, or let's actually do some of the recovery work so that we're not actually blindsided by it in the future. That, that's the type of my other work is really about. You don't look at psychoanalysis and say, oh my god, we're never going to get to the unconscious. We did, it's 
not good. So like, let's, <laughs> let's go home. Let's do it. You actually do work to uncover it. That's what Grim defines as aesthetic pleasure. Cool. If that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> then you're on board. Tom. Kidding me? Oh, it doesn't work. I just want to say something about this idea that uh, that practice is uh, more real than authors. Uh, that that idea really bothers me, and um, uh, and I, I guess I want to say this about it: that I think that, um, that that architectural work and contributions to the discipline happen at all different levels, uh, and I don't want to give some kind of false hierarchy to things to say that practice over an individual author. Uh, um, is, is somehow has, has uh, I don't know, more, more, not just more reality, but more, um, uh, it, that, exists, that it exists more than an individual author. Uh, I would say that, that, an, uh, that authors have style, uh, that practices have style, that educational institutions have style, and, and that those are real things, that, that's, that style is a real thing. Um, uh, not, in the, not in the case, I don't mean stylistic, but I mean style. Flavor. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and I just, I want to make sure, I, I just, that was really disturbing to hear that, that somehow practice was, was going to be over-ordinated over, over, um, uh, over authorship. Um, I, I also, um, I find it s uh, somewhat cynical, not, not at all what you said, um, uh, Michael, just the idea that, that, um, uh, that even within a singular architectural practice that, that its inventions um, uh, uh, in, the, in the realm of, of, of form or tectonics or space or wh whatever it's doing, that those would somehow be overshadowed by some kind of organizational structure or some kind of BIM modeling or some kind of project delivery method or all of those things that you mentioned in Ben Van Berkel's practice. It's, it, it, all, it, it all makes sense, and I understand what Ben is up to, but I don't think in any way that that overshadows or is more real than, than, than the work that, that actually occurs, it, the, the sort of strange products that occur in any given practice. But, 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 by the way, in the UN case, it's, it, that may be the narrative, but the war remains looking the same. So of course, uh, that, well, no, but, but, no, 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 no. My, my my point was simply: if you're going to make an argument for the the, the let's say the, the primacy of practice, then a pro, then go for then make the argument in the case of a of a practice that is really known for formal expression. If you can make it there, then that's a different kind of argument than simply ar making an argument for a practice that is who's that is defined precisely by its practice, not by its let's say product. So. Yeah, I, I, I was, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't, ar hmm. I'm simply drawing circles and saying that there are things inside them and inside of one of those circles uh, that is making an appeal to the real, I think is, is practice. Inside of one of those, or, or let's say the appeal the circles, to practice. The circles are next to each other and there are a lot of circles. That's there are a lot saying. of circles, <laughs> a lot of ideologies. That's true. Yeah, but also Tom, what, what you're saying also, will, which it will take, uh, this is maybe the one in five years, and the whole notion of authorship also it would, would be put on the table in terms of what, what are the rules of engagement in today about the idea of what authorship is. And you can think, for example, the very basic example is a fashion house, like, uh, if you're like right now Christian Dior or whatever. Those guys have been there for 50 years. I think they keep hiring direct creative directors that they design inspired by whatever Christian Dior or Yves Saint Laurent did at one time, even though they became their own brand. So is whatever, um, Christian Dior by Ralph, Ralph Simmons, which is a very weird thing, you know what I mean? Like when you have two authors. So what constitutes authorship today, I think it's also a whole, it's a much more complex discussion. And I think, again, we're not gonna unravel here today, but the, I think there is a whole series of intersection between that, which is a fascinating subject about where it ends, where it stops, how much. And also, to me, that has been one of the big, big part of the component of the technology. What, what, what is the role of, partnership or authorship in relation to technology in the way that authors or artists or architects or musicians operate today versus it was 40 years ago. The rules are, the rules are profoundly different. One more question. Mark. I know who my boss is. This has is. been wonderful. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to give Michael, uh, Michael the final word. But I did want to make one uh, observation that I think one thing that keeps coming up in a couple of these conversations, and certainly in your question that, uh, from last night or the night before, that worries me is uh, the mentality of what can I use from this today? Yeah, what can I use immediately? Terrible. And I just wanted to remind at least my students, if not anyone else, that it took 
a good 20 years to get from Derrida's early writings to the deconstruction show at MoMA, and 250 years to get from the humanism of Brunelleschi to the exoticism of Borromini. And you're talking about on night one of a conference, how can I use that today, is turning philosophy into a product and turning you into a consumer. And a consumerist agenda for philosophy and ideas is the most dangerous threat to ideas that exist today. So I'm calling for a moment, and I introduce this symposium, as an invitation to curiosity that had no claims. Yet everyone, a lot of people seem incapable of allowing that to gestate without jumping forward to the immediate conclusions as to how that can be active. And I would just like to return to the spirit of an invitation to curiosity, which I think this has been in a wonderful exchange of ideas, but not give the impression that this is a product that we're gonna buy and pull off the shelf, and if it doesn't work immediately, we're gonna throw it away. There's some fundamental ideas shifting in philosophy and in all of these disciplines that I had you know, brought together, I could have brought together others, but that are addressing some fundamental shift in mentality. And I think that's worth talking about. I also think it's worth thinking about, and I think it's worth thinking about for more than a night. So. I get the final word. Okay, uh, I have no real final word except thank you all for, uh, for staying for this. Thank you for, to the wonderful panelists. Um, and uh, for the one or two questions, we didn't have a lot of time for questions from the audience. But the next panel starts, Mark, does it start immediately like oh. this one did? Uh, uh, Sorry? Okay. <laughs> all right, I, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry. Before my five years of fame are up, I wanted to get something in. <laughs> and Michael, your speech was wonderful. I really appreciate the support you've given us in taking us seriously. Uh, really wonderful. There were only two things I disagreed with with you, and I just put them in in case it helps clarify the conversation. The first is I'm with Tom. That For me, practice has always been a kind of fool's goal. And I say this with apologies to Albina and my friend Bruno Latour. Practice is still anthropocentric. Right? It's still, it's, it's a human who's doing stuff instead of a human who's thinking about stuff. And yes, this may seem more politically progressive because then you can talk about the handicraft of the people who are usually the subalterns and we're gonna invert the political pyramid. But it's still anthropocentric. And Triple O has been against specifically this reading of Heidegger, which is how Heidegger has been watered down and his impact has been overly tempered. The other thing I actually disagreed with is a small point. I don't see Rem Kohlhaas's Biennale as a return to the real. I see it as a return to the basic, which is not the real because the real can also be the compound so I saw Rem's show in my terms as a kind of undermining. That let's just look at arches and keys. I don't see it as a return to the real, but that's... Okay, we'll let that be the end of... <laughs>